as I'm thinking about becoming 80, I scan over my whole life and I begin really appreciating and thinking about moments that were turning points, things that have been so important to me. What is it that I haven't finished? And what is it that's most important to me? Being 80 seems to be a really important turning point. And I took a year, a year and a half, really meditating on what's important to me. Where do I want to put my energy? Is there anything I haven't finished with? To think that I've lived eight decades. I love the idea of being 80. It just seems amazing. I guess that's the purpose of being an elder, to have time to reflect, remember, and experience the gratitude of having grown up in this life which really doesn't exist much anymore. And how easy it is when you're younger and engaged and bringing up kids and to forget that this is transient, this beauty, this life. I was born into a Quaker family, a descendant of Lucretia Mott. I went to the Quaker meeting, especially with my mother when she was older. And I had Quaker grandparents and important guidance from wise elder Quakers. And I always loved the silence. I felt once I settled in and just rested in the silence, I loved it. In recent years, and particularly in my late 70s and early 80s, I've become quite fascinated and grateful for what I have experienced in my professional life, in my life as a social activist, and how grappling with Jonathan's death has widened my modality of service, as well as enriched my own personal life. And I've been particularly struck with when people come to me. I'm a clinical social worker. I'm also a musician. And in my private practice, I've combined um, sound healing therapy with spiritual inquiry and all the roots of psychotherapy. So my practice now combines body, mind, spirit using Tibetan bowls is a bomb for the wounded soul. So combining these sounds with Tibetan bowls and overtones. It's a kind of wordless blessing. And I've seen that it's a tool of great comfort when I'm seeing people in grief. Everything falls away, not only for myself, but I see that, hear it, experience it. And there is a sense of divine connectedness. And I always feel this is the greatest, one of the greatest gifts I've received. In 1992, I got a call in the middle of the night and our son, Jonathan, were told he was dead. And we couldn't believe it. At first we were told he committed suicide. And that moment changed my life. Everything changed after that. We later found out that his death was an accident. He died sniffing nitrous. But the pain of his death and how that catapulted me into a different kind of life was intense and has been partly a guiding light in my life, both the sorrow and the gratitude and the amazement to be alive. 
when I was living in Berkeley and I built a meditation place based on Japanese room, Japanese tea house. And I used to go there and try to meditate, but I was in such a state of despair that I could hardly sit still for more than five minutes without weeping, which I did. But over time, just the quiet, empty space and knowing I had a place where I could go and I wouldn't be judged and I could allow myself to feel what was happening. How much help when we're grieving we get from others and how easy it is to feel terrible about ourselves, especially if you lose a child and everyone feels, what did I do wrong? And it's easy to lose a sense of who you are and your own goodness. I think I was seeking some kind of um, sustenance and solace that I eventually located in part of my childhood. And I don't think I could have accessed this piece unless I left. So coming back provided a touchstone for discovering something within myself. I think the emotional part was um, imagining what he would have loved doing, continue doing if he grew up. That was very, really tugged at my heart because I was longing for him to experience this. And at the same time, as soon as I turned the corner and smelt the salt water and saw the windmill, I felt this is my roots. I felt at home. And I immediately took off my shoes and ran around and went down to the river and, and smelled the water and put my face in the salt. Everyone who has, has um, allowed themselves to be honed, to, be, to walk through the fire of loss and grief and suffering. A doorway opens, and the doorway may be a different kind, maybe a sense that those who have died do not die. As I reflect back over the 26 years, one of the things that really strikes me is how I received such sustenance from my women friends especially. There seems to be a kind of power in a, a circle of women that is different in our one-to-one -one friendships. Yesterday I was in the Quaker Meeting House in Nantucket, which is where Lucretia Mott grew up. And I was really stunned by the silence and the sense of being connected to people I didn't even know. No one spoke in the meeting, it was completely silent. But the quality of being, the kind of essence of my soul, I felt that with other people. And then as I reflected, thinking about my experience in Buddhism, I was thinking how similar the embodied sensation is of just sitting quietly. For me, having a Sangha, being with a group of people who were meditating was a tremendous help. That may not be so for everyone, people who are deeply introverted, but for me, as an extrovert, it was that companionship of other people who cared about me and who were learning to quiet their minds without any kind of pretense about what would happen. Just learning to be more quiet, to sit quietly, ring the bell. And I think that the ritual of sitting, of coming and giving thanks by bowing when you enter, honoring the space, keeping it clean and neat, and then being in silence with other people and lighting a candle, lighting incense, 
all of those forms are a way of where ritual designates this is an important moment and I found that tremendously nurturing I felt as if I'd just come home everything about Green Gulch reminds me of my life in Kyoto and just be in this beautiful silence with the container of the Japanese gardens and Japanese spirit and this sense of beauty and conscious caretaking in order in the midst of a world which can feel very chaotic and which felt chaotic to me many years after Jonathan died. I would just come for the day, walk through the gardens, walk down to the ocean where we scattered Jonathan's ashes. One of the reasons I love coming here to Green Gulch is because this particular garden is the Jizo Garden. Every year there was a ceremony for children who died. Jizo is the guardian of children and travelers. So I would come to these Jizo statues, and like these little ones here that you see. You would walk in Kyoto, walk in the mountains by the hillside, and you'd just come upon a little stone sitting in, in the hillside. But I remember when Jonathan, I was pregnant like this, walking in the cherry blossoms in Kyoto, and I asked Jizo to take care of him. So this place in Green Gulch has been and still is a really important place to me. I feel as if Jizo came and helped me, supported me. I'm just grateful I can come back here whenever I want to. And what's amazing to me is when I come now, I don't feel grief. I just feel I'm so blessed to have these practices and these traditions and to have had a son like Jonathan. And I see Jizo has a little smile on his face. Thank you, Jizo. Over time, Gradually, I began to be able to find refuge in the, in the silence. It didn't happen all at once, certainly not. It was as if my sorrow and despair evaporated for a short time. So that gave me a kind of mini experience of the possibility of coming back to some kind of life. Friends came and meditated with me, simply resting quietly, not talking, gives a feeling of sustenance. Certainly for me, it was very important. Every time I come back, besides, of course, seeing all the family, cousins and nieces and nephews and bringing my own young children, I feel this deep connection as if my roots are in this land. And when I smell the salt air and I swim in the river, I, I feel as if I'm connected not only with myself but with the lineage. And since I live in California, the experience of coming back is actually much stronger than when I was growing up and just took it for granted. I see generations of kids the same age I was when I came here. And I see them being so free, and I can just imagine myself at that age. I just want to show you in here, this is the sitting room. I think the house we were told was built in the late 1600s or in 1690. And this is a uh, photograph of Lucretia Mott who was my great-great-great-grandmother. There she is with her Quaker bonnet. And I guess as I was growing up as a kid, 
I always knew about her. She was a feminist and had, had uh, helped write the Declaration of Women's Independence at Seneca Falls. She was part of this place. Her whole life, she was really carrying the message of the Quakers of follow thy inner light, and she was very active in the abolition of slavery, always working for justice and equality for all beings. As I've been reflecting on what I might be able to share with people who come to me after they've lost a child or lost a spouse and are simply unraveled. Advice concerning my experience with meditation with silence and emptiness. Uh, one of the things that I've said to people and that I would say to anyone is that often when you're at a complete loss, you turn to some kind of spiritual inquiry. And it might be meditation, it might also be another form of religious practice. But every practice has at its core seeking solace and often silence. And I guess what I would say for people who are new meditators or trying to find sustenance in times of acute grief and beginning to meditate, that it's important to just allow the unraveling and the grief. If you're overcome with grief, it's, it's okay to cry. It's part of the practice. Very often when people first meditate, there's old wounds and sorrows that arise that maybe you hadn't even known about. And just allowing that grief to be present and knowing that it will pass and knowing that other people you don't even know also have suffered grief, that provides solace.